Mozart, opera. <laughs> Why did Mozart consider himself primarily an opera composer? That's a good question. Um, there are many possible answers to that. One is that it gave him a chance to write many, many, many melodies within the course of the same work. He was very melodically driven. There are some composers who are more melodists than others. Mozart was a melodist. Despite the image we have of him just falling out of bed and endlessly making up melodies, as I think I may have said before, that is true, but then he worked on them. He worked very hard on his melodies to make them into the pristine things of beauty that we admire today. So that's one reason. Another reason was he was fascinated by humanity. And what is more the story of humanity artistically than opera? So he actually wrote his first works for the stage. I'm, we have to take that a little loosely when he was 11, because the, the first work that he actually wrote was a sacred Zingspiel, that is, a piece with spoken dialogue, and it was sacred, which would make it more like an oratorio, but it's still considered an opera. Um, by the time he was 20, he had written well over a dozen. And uh, he wrote from the time he was 11 until his death, that's 24 years, he wrote 23 operas. There are, were some years where he didn't write any, but then there were years when he wrote a number. Um, a lot of the earlier ones were produced in Salzburg, as could be understood, that was his home base. But by the time he was a teenager, they were being, um, some of them were being produced in places like Milan, which was, of course, one of the places that he went on tour with his father when he was a teenager. And he learned a great deal about Italian operatic com composition when he was there. He was like a sponge. He just absorbed all of this material. And um, then when he did further tours, he also had some of his operas produced in Munich, and then finally in Vienna, where he settled in 1781 and 1782. Um, of his first 17 operas, only four of them were not produced during his lifetime, which is a really good record when you consider uh, how difficult it was to spread the word on anything without a publisher. I mean, this was before. Um, the real age of publication, which kind of began with, with Beethoven, where it was easier, much easier to disseminate works of music. Um, so that's a good record. Um, and he worked with a number of different librettists. But one thing that is really important to remember about his writing for opera is that he had really firm ideas about the characters in the story and what he wanted from the librettist. So although we think of a couple of his f most famous collaborators, namely Lorenzo da Ponte and also Emmanuel Schikaneder, who wrote the uh, libretto for The Magic Flute, Mozart was not above coaxing, cajoling, or bullying his uh, librettists into getting what he wanted. So when we talk about psychological insight, and you can't talk about Mozart's great operas without talking about psychological insight, when we talk about that, we can give some of the credit to whoever wrote the original play or story on which the libretto was based, some of the credit to the librettist, but a lot of the credit to Mozart, not just in selecting the words and the portions of text that he wanted or that he wanted changed, but also in what he was able to show about the human condition through the music. And that's what's really, really important because so much of it, you can close your eyes, you can get a tremendous amount out of a Mozart opera just by listening, even if you don't know the language. And he was 
wonderful at adapting himself to the language. Of course, he was a native German speaker. And yet his operas in Italian are the operas of an Italian. What I always say is when he was writing in Italian, he was an Italian composer. When he was writing in German, he was a German composer. And if you listen to the difference between uh, Don Giovanni, for instance, and the magic flute, in terms of how the melodies are written, you can hear a really big difference in, in style. And it's not just because the story is different, it's because the language is different. And so he is adapting what he's doing um, to the language, also to the particular singer, singers he was writing for. Okay? Today, we are covering a two and three quarter hour opera in an hour and a quarter. <laughs> the Le, Le Nozze di Figaro was Mozart's 18th opera. It was produced first at the Bourg Theatre in, on the 5th of May in 1786. So by this time he was 30. He was married, he had a couple of kids. He was, had been living in Vienna for about four years. Um, it was quite successful. And then it went on to Prague, which was a much smaller musical setting than Vienna. But Prague went absolutely wild for the marriage of Figaro. And Mozart was thrilled. He went there later that year, 1786, as they were producing it. And then it was produced in late December and into January. And he went to um, a gathering uh, afterwards at which a number of the uh, pieces were excerpted in instrumental form. And he wrote something to the effect of, they're just playing Figaro. They're singing Figaro. They're talking Figaro. There is nothing but Figaro. It's a great moment for me. <laughs> and when we listen to the tunes in Figaro, there's no reason why that shouldn't be so. The, the, move, the music is just overflowing with great tunes that also at the same time are very fitting to the moment, to the dramatic or comedic moment. And you can tell when you listen to the overture and when you listen to this work where Rossini got a lot of his operatic inspiration. Was Rossini Italian? Sure he was. So he had a great tradition to draw on. But his nickname when he was a teenager was Il Tedeschino, the little German, because he was such an admirer of Mozart and Beethoven. And so he got a lot from this. And it shows up in The Barber of Seville, among other places, which was produced actually 30 years afterwards. Now, a little bit about the history before of, of this, of the text of the opera before we start to listen. Um, this is the second of a set of three plays written by the French uh, dramatist Beaumarchais uh, about a set of characters. The first one is The Barber of Seville. The second is The Marriage of Figaro. And the third, nobody ever does, because it was very depressing. And it was something like The, the Troubled Wife or something like that. Um, in the first one, Figaro is this kind of man about town who becomes the servant or helper to Count Almaviva as he's wooing. Uh, Rosina and trying to lure her away from her guardian who actually wants to marry her because she's got a lot of money even though she's about a third his age. That all works out well. In the second play, um, Figaro has been rewarded by being made the head of the household of all the servants and he is wishing to get married to uh, the lady's maid, Susanna. The marriage of Almaviva and Rosina has hit some bumps because the count has uh, done what many noble counts do in that he's had a roving eye and been able to satisfy that roving eye in a way that, that hurts his wife and where she is really sorrowful about that. And the story carries on from there. Um, the big change that was made from the play 
to the opera libretto was that the play actually had a really hard time being staged because it was so political. Now you have to understand that the play um, was written in 1784. That's five years before the French Revolution, but during a time of great political ferment in France. Near the end of the play, Figaro has a big speech where he, where he decries nobility and the privilege that comes with nobility. Well, of course, that didn't go over very well with the censors. So one of the first things that Lorenzo da Ponte did, and this was his first collaboration with Mozart, by the way, uh, his second being Così fan tutte, and the third one being uh, Don Giovanni. The first thing that he did was he got rid of all the political speech in it. So it became a domestic comedy rather than one with political implications. So that rant about privilege becomes a rant uh, instead in Act 4 about um, unfaithful wives. <laughs> so it becomes personal rather than political. The libretto centers on two couples. One very happy, about to get married. The other unhappy reminds me of the opening of the novel Anna Karenina. Uh, every family, every happy family is happy in the same way. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Um, the play basically is about the count who has abolished the medieval droit du seigneur, which was the right of the nobleman to take any young bride in his household to bed before her wedding night. He had abolished that when he married, um, when he married Rosina. So he had actually signed off on that. But he's trying to backpedal because he's very attracted to Susanna. She knows that, and she's... Um, at the beginning, you see, she's quite nervous about how close to the Count's bedroom their bedroom is going to be once they're married. Um, so the whole play is basically about him wanting her, her and the other two, trying to fool him and teach the Count a lesson. And there's all sorts of... Um, craziness that goes on with people hiding in closets and being discovered and jumping out of windows. And it also involves a young man named Cherubino who has a very roving eye and keeps getting caught in compromising positions and infuriates the Count um, for a number of reasons. Um, well, he's jealous because he thinks that Carabino is attached to his wife, but, <laughs> well, maybe. Um, but uh, in any case, that is a trouser role. It's usually sung by a mezzo-soprano or a soprano. And um, so his, his problem, that is Carabino's problem, is that he can't decide on a particular woman. And he just, his head spins when he thinks about them all. And so um, this is a, 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 an opera in four acts. I'm going to show you four different clips, OK? Some are longer than others. The first one, we're starting right at the beginning um, with the overture and going through the first scene with Figaro and, and uh, Susanna planning the final, making the final plans for their wedding. He's measuring out the room, and she's coming in with her new headgear to say, isn't this wonderful? And then they're talking about different things and having a, a, a duet, and Figaro finds out about the count. Uh, the Count's designs on Susanna, so he vows to stop him. By the way, another thing that this opera is about is um, men's bumbling attempts <laughs> at um, sort of butting heads and establishing territory, and women's far more subtle ways of getting things done. Because the men's plans basically fall apart in a lot of ways, whereas the women's plans manage to move along OK. Um, 
so anyway, that's the first 15 minutes. And this is a performance uh, from Paris in 1993. It's a filmed performance. But I think what happens in it, when you see the overture, you'll notice that the orchestra is on the stage. Oh. And then it stops. And then it goes. You hear applause. So I think what happened was they filmed some things like the overture with them on the stage. And then they went to performance. So you can see sets changing. And you can hear applause and things like that. And it's clearly on a stage. Um, and it stars the wonderful Bryn Terfel, the Welsh bass baritone, as Figaro. Uh, Alison Hagley as Susanna. Rodney Gilfrey as um, the Count uh, Hilevi Martin Pelto. I don't know who she is, but she's a great Rosina. Uh, Pamela Helen Stephen uh, plays Cherubino as the Monteverdi Choir, the English Baroque soloist. So you will see in the overture historical instruments. So the flutes are, are uh, without uh, keys. They're with holes. And the clarinets are old and, and light wood. And the marvelous John Elliott Gardner conducting. So here's the overture and the first part of Marriage of Figaro. And by the way, you're going to be really angry with me at the end because I have to keep stopping it. <laughs> OK? And I had to make choices. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> OK, starts right off.
how many women there are in the orchestra? It's pretty cool. <laughs>
Oh. 
person. Uh, yeah, well, it's amazing. There's something in the water that creates baritones and basses. <laughs> Most of the operatic ones you see are about 6'3 at least. What? It's just uh, the one exception to that that I'm aware of who's singing now is Simon Keenly Side. Yes. Um, and he's not tall. But uh, the Count is just as tall as he. Um, James Morris, who sang bass for years at the Met, about 6'3". All these guys, they're all big. I, I think they need more, more space for those deep notes. And how starkly simple the set is compared to the elaborate sets we're used to seeing. Yes, which is, uh, this is a much more European approach. Um, you'll notice um, the other thing about Mozart is he loves human interaction. Mm -hmm. He loves playing cards. He loves playing billiards, going out, visiting, sitting in taverns with his friends. And so you can see the conversations and the way he sets up duets and trios and quartets to get things the way he repeats certain words. So he gets wonderful musical effects. But at the same time, he also um, furthers his storytelling and our insights into the characters through the music and the way he sets things up. So I'm sure that he was saying things to Da Ponte, such as, I need a quartet here. I need a duet here. That's what operatic composers have been doing since the mid-18th century, is saying to their librettists, this is what I need here. So personally, when David Budbill was turning parts of Judavine into a fleeting animal, I said, we've got these new characters. I want a quartet here. Oh. I want a quartet there. I want a love duet here. And it gave him the chance to do that. It was one of the things he liked about it was he was always wanting to improvise. He was a jazz guy. And, he, and so it gave him a chance to not just add characters, but to give them dimension through having these things, and I've got to confess, my inspiration was Don Giovanni, in terms of having four people saying four different things at the same time and having it work together musically. And what you do is you make sure that they're repeating their lines enough time that they get to sing it once where you can hear that line carefully or clearly, and then going on, you don't need to hear it so much, you just see how it's layered and how they all work together. So, anyway, Thank you. something you didn't know. No. <laughs> All right, we are now skipping ahead to about, well, into the, um, the, 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 the end of the first act, where we have Carabino who comes in and saying, oh, so many young women, I just can't decide. Or it should be, so many young women, I just can't decide. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, the Count wants to punish him because he finds him hanging around with Barbarina, who is the daughter of the gardener, and he thinks that he's chasing after the skirt of his own wife, the Countess, and things like that. But he can't, he can't catch him. And so what happens is there's all this stuff where they're hiding from each other under clothing and behind chairs and they get discovered and undiscovered and all sorts of crazy things. And finally, the Count just says, okay, I forgive you and so I'm actually going to promote you. I'm sending you off to the army. <laughs> and so where we come in, um, Figaro, who's going to have a good time with Carabino, says, okay, no more gallivanting around for you. Now it's time to march. So we pick this up around, whoops. Okay. So the townspeople have come to, um, this is Figaro's idea, to say, oh, we're going to have a wedding. Isn't it great, Count? Thank you so much. And so, of course, that puts them on the spot because, you know, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, we are going to actually have the wedding because there is a subplot in which Don Bartolo, who has never forgiven Figaro from helping the Count to swipe uh, Rosina to, to marry her, um, is plotting with Marcellina, who had loaned Figaro some money 
and he promised to marry her if he couldn't pay back the money. So now the count has heard of this and says, okay, I will use this to my advantage. So Figaro says, I'll outsmart him. He brings in all the townspeople to say, hey, we're going to have a wedding. Isn't that wonderful? So anyway, that's where we are. Oh, this is nothing. This is nothing. That's <laughs> true.
Okay, so now we go to the next act. And we come in on the countess, who is sick at heart by, because of her husband's philandering. And she sings about how sad she is and how difficult her life is because of what he's doing to her. Um, so it follows immediately. I'm just going to skip ahead a little so that we get to um, actual action here. <laughs> see that although this is a comedy, the only way the comedy works, and Shakespeare knew this, is if there are actually serious matters at hand that can then be resolved satisfactorily. And so Mozart has to give us some reason to care what happens to the countess. And he gives us it there in spades. Because what follows is French farce, really, because there, she, the first thing she asks is, so my husband's really trying to seduce you, right? And she says, oh, Susanna says, well, he's just giving me, he just wants to do a little business transaction. Um, and she's, she's trying to lessen the count's culpability, even though she's not going to give in to him. Um, then Carabino comes in, and then a count comes in, so Carabino hides and locks the door in the closet, and the count says, I'm going to break down the door, and then I'm going to stab that kid. And they say, no, 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 no. The, the, the countess says, no, 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 it's, it's not Carabino. It's Susanna. She's trying on her wedding dress. So he says, well, where's the key? And she says, well, it's out in the other room. So they go out, and then 
gets, it gets unlocked and Carabino comes out and then, um, and then Susanna goes in, takes his place, and so the Count comes in and he goes and he finds Susanna and he says, oh, I guess I was wrong. How did that happen? So then, of course, we get to the point where Carabino comes back in and so well, what do I do now? And the, the doors are all locked. How do I get out of here? And she said, well, there is the window. <laughs> he jumps out of the window, breaks a lot of the flower pots, kind of lands on the gardener, who's an old drunk, and eventually comes in and says, ah, I found him in the garden. And eventually Figaro, I said, no, no, that was me. I did that. But where we come in is after he's just jumped out of the window. <laughs> Uh, yeah, only this time he jumped out of the bedroom window.
And that's the end of Act Two. Um, <laughs> that's amazing, huh? So. Act three is actually taken up with the resolution of this little drama because what happens is um, Figaro is stuck with this contract, but uh, Rosina finally comes in with money and says, I can buy him out of this. He can pay off the loan. In the meantime, Figaro has said, well, you know, I, I can't marry you unless I have my parents' consent, and I don't know who my parents are <laughs> because I was stolen at birth. Sound like Gilbert and Sullivan, right? <laughs> and so to make a long story short, what happens is um, they discover that actually Marcellina is his mother and, and, and Bartolo is his father, so they decide to have a double wedding. Oh. <laughs> so the wedding takes place and thus ends Act Three. Um, but the Count hasn't given up his plans with regard to Susanna. So in a final attempt to teach him a lesson once and for all, in separate plots, Figaro and the two women decide to pull, to have a switch where the two women are going to exchange clothing. So he thinks that he's meeting her, meeting Susanna after dark, but he's actually going to be seducing his own wife. So we come in on the darkness and Carabino, who has turned up once again like a bad penny and is threatening to gum up the entire works.
thinks that this is actually Suzanne.
we could probably spend another two or three classes just on this one opera. I could probably teach about 30 weeks on Mozart operas. We got an hour and a half on this one, sorry. But I hope it whets your appetite. It's that performance that's on your sheet. Feel free to watch it all. It's terrific. Um, you will see some similarities in a couple of weeks when we deal with Don Giovanni. Same, uh, same librettist and the same interesting um, distribution of voices. Two main sopranos and another soprano who is sort of a country lass. Um, main characters who are basses. There is a tenor in Don Giovanni, but the tenors are minor characters here. So it's, it's mainly basses and baritones and sopranos in, in both. There's no trouser role in Don Giovanni, but there are a lot of similarities in the way it's set up. You'll also notice all that legalistic patter. Rossini knew about that, and he uses it in The Barber of Seville as well. That <laughs> all right, next week, complete change of pace. We do more chamber music. Thank you.